Uh, with that, uh, we are going to move on to the county executive's presentation of the proposed FY 2025 and FY 2026 multi-year budget plan. And while the county executive is getting ready for that presentation, I just want to remind everyone, even though we do this, I remind everyone, no one acts like I've reminded everyone, that this is the first step of a very lengthy process. This is, in fact, a proposal. This is not the budget. Uh, we will have public hearings on this proposal. Uh, the board will adopt something different uh, than what is being presented here today, and that's the beauty of the public engagement process. Uh, we have several months here uh, between today's presentation and when we adopt the budget, and so there will be a lot of public hearings. Individual supervisors will have budget committee meetings uh, within their districts, town halls, uh, and we will get a lot of input uh, on this budget proposal uh, that we are about to hear. And at the end of the presentation, you'll hear the county executive walk through the next steps in the process, including the public hearing dates and all the other activities that will take place so that we can get good public input on this proposal. Uh, with that being said, I am going to turn the mic over to our county executive, Mr. Brian Hill. Welcome. Uh, good morning, and thank you, uh, Chairman McKay, members of the board. Uh, Supervisors Spearman and Jimenez, welcome to uh, the budget gauntlet. We, we appreciate you being here, sir. Uh, last year when I presented my FY24 proposed budget to the board, I noted that we were anticipating a troubling revenue picture that, and tight budget for fiscal 2025. At that time, we projected flat residential assessments, slight gr growth in commercial and real estate, potential interest rate reductions by the Federal Reserve. Although our current updated projections include continued elevated interest income, our net overall real estate picture has not substantially changed from our estimates a year ago. We are seeing some residential growth, but our commercial values have declined, resulting in an overall real estate growth of just over 2.7 percent, paired with significant expenditure pressures, particularly for employee pay and benefits, transportation requirements, continued inflationary impacts, balancing this proposed budget has required some difficult decisions. With this backdrop, I present the FY 2025 advertised budget plan for your consideration. Like our budget last year, the FY 2025 budget is focused on supporting and stabilizing our employees and core services. A substantial portion of the overall budget increase is directed to our partners at Fairfax County Public Schools. The superintendent's proposed budget prioritizes compensation, addressing enrollment growth, and changing student demographics and continuing multi-year investments. As articulated in the budget, in the board's budget priorities, our focus likewise remains on our employees. With over 82% of the proposed county disbursement growth attributable to employee pay increases, including our recently negotiated collective bargaining agreements and benefit requirements. Other county adjustments are included for our required debt service payments and our commitments to funding Metro and our connector bus system. Our revenue increase at the current real estate tax rate will not support these expenditure increases. Therefore, I have proposed a four cent increase on the real estate tax rate in order to balance the advertised rate. All other county increases, including investments in board priorities, such as funding for environmental initiatives, park support, early childhood education, inflationary and contract rate adjustments, and information technology infrastructure are completely offset by $36 million in identified savings and reductions. Our reduction exercise, which was supported by staff from across our organization, has also identified 85, excuse me, 84 positions that can be eliminated. 
However, I've recommended to include 42 new positions. So in other words, for every new position we have recommended to add, we have identified two positions for elimination. As I'll discuss throughout this presentation, we are continuing to monitor state budget action, particularly as it relates to schools and Metro funding, as well as Metro's action on its own budget. I recommend that the board consider advertising a tax rate that provides flexibility to adjust to what we expect will be an evolving environment throughout this budget season. Before we turn to our revenue projections, I want to provide some context on the national and local economies. For fiscal, excuse me, for 2023, the national economy grew at a rate of 2.5% up from 1.9 increase in 2022. Defying expectations of a slowdown, the labor market remained remarkably resilient despite the impact of higher interest rates. Payroll growth averaged 255,000 jobs per month in 2023. The economy continued to add jobs in 2024 with 353,000 jobs added in January. The unemployment rate stands at 3.7% as of last month. In addition to continued employment growth over the last year, the major economic story has been moderating inflation. In December, the year-over-year -year increase in the consumer price index was 3.4%, down considerably from December 2022's rate of 6.5%. The region's Econ economy performed well in 2023, though it is lagging peer metropolitan areas and job growth. The number of jobs in Northern Virginia grew at a rate of 2% in 2023, after increasing 3.3% in 2022. Significant economic uncertainty remains as to whether the region is in the midst of a soft landing or a start of a recession. The county's unemployment rate was 2.5% in 2023, which is unchanged from the prior year. Based on preliminary estimates, the county's economy increased at a rate of 2% in 2023 and is expected to grow to 2.1% in 2024. This slide provides a history of the annual changes in general fund revenue. Similar to last year, the chart shows revenue growth related to our normal revenue base and does not include the impact of one-time federal stimulus funding that the county received in FY 2020 through FY 2022. The FY 2025 revenue forecast includes an estimate of 6% growth over our current 2024 estimates. This assumes a $0.04 increase to the real estate tax rate. Our revenue growth rate at the current real estate tax rate would be 3.5%. As we look ahead to FY26, our early projections indicate flat revenue growth under 1%. Excuse me. This slide provides information about some of the major general fund revenue categories. As you know, the county relies primarily on the real estate tax to fund county operations. In FY 2025, approximately 66% of the general fund re revenue is derived from real estate taxes, which are project projected to increase 6.8% over FY 2024 as a result of equalization and the increase in the tax rate. <coughs> Excuse me. Personal property taxes are projected to increase 8.8%. In FY 2025, after decreasing 2.3% in FY 24, the FY 25 projection assumes an assessment ratio of 100%. With the number of vehicles in the county anticipated to increase by 1%, personal property tax relief from the state, which has been capped since fiscal 20, sorry, excuse me, capped since fiscal 20, 2007, is estimated to provide a 50% reduction in FY25. Growth in sales tax revenue is projected as slow as the impact on the federal stimulus begins to wane. It is in, 
expected to be up 1.6% in FY24 and another 1% in FY25. BPOL is a revenue category for which we currently do not have any actual data as businesses file and pay on March 1st based on their gross receipts during the previous calendar year. BPOL grew rapidly in fiscals 22 and 23 as the economy recovered. The advertised budget assumes slower growth. Investment interest revenue increased significantly in both fiscals 23 and 24 as the Federal Reserve raised rates to deal with inflation. The Federal Reserve is expected to make several rate cuts at some point during the calendar year of 2024. While our staff in the Department of Finance have been working to lock in current yields into FY 2025, we expect to see a slight decrease in revenue as interest rates begin to fall. The real estate tax base is projected to increase 2.73%. Residential real estate experienced an overall increase in value of 2.86%, primarily due to low inventory. Commercial real estate, on the other hand, decreased by 1.24%. The next two slides will have more details on each. The value of one penny on the real estate tax rate is $32.32 million for fiscal 25. The combined impact of equalization and the proposed four cent increase in tax rate to $1.13 and a half cents results in an average increase on the tax bill to just under $524. Because of the decline in non-residential values in FY 2025, our commercial and industrial base has continued to decline to just 15.6%. In the residential real estate market, the average sales price of homes sold in the county rose 3.8% during calendar year 23. The number of homes sold decreased 22.6% as increased mortgage rates made homes less affordable. Homes that sold during the year stayed on the market for an average of 18 days, which is one day longer than it did in 2022. The appreciation in home values has experienced across the board. Of the more than 312,000 taxable residential properties in, in the county with equalization changes, over 89% saw an increase in assessed value, while only 3% experienced a decrease. This year, single family home and townhomes values lag condominiums after outpacing them for the last two years. Single family homes values increased 2.8%, which is down from the 11 and 8% increases in 23 and 24. Single family homes are the largest component of the county's residential base, making up 72% of the residential equalization value. Townhomes increased 3%, also down from last year. Condos were up 4.21%, approximately, approximately the same amount as the past four years. Overall, residential equalization was up just under 3%. <clears throat> Non-residential equalization is down by 1.24% in fiscal 2025. The amount of empty office space increased to 21.6 million square feet. The direct office vacancy rate in the county was 17.2% at the end of 23, which is up from 16.7% from the prior year. There are currently five buildings with 1 million square feet of office space currently under con construction in Fairfax County. Three of the office buildings under construction commence work without a committed tenant but are expected to capture some of the trophy office demand due to their location along the Silver Line and the proximity to amenities. Due to increases in vacancy rates, higher capitalization rates, and the difficulties in securing commercial financing, the office sector continues to struggle. Office elevator properties, the second largest component 
of the non-residential tax base experienced a decline of 9.1% in fiscal 2025 and are down for the fourth year in a row. Apartments, retail, industrial properties were generally stable with slightly higher assessments in some cases. Data centers are included in the industrial category. With several new developments nearing completion and coming online, we will see a change next year. The biggest gainer was hotels for the second year in a row, increasing to 22% with our higher occupancies and increasing revenue. <clears throat> Slide nine provides a summary of the overall budget proposal. In the top half of the chart, total projected increase in available funding is shown to be just under $363 million. That amount includes the impact of a proposed increase in a cigarette tax from 30 cents to 40 cents per pack. Although this change provides some increased resources in 25, it should be noted that the revenue category has been trending down for 11 consecutive years. There are also several adjustments resulting from the efforts by our staff to identify additional resources, which I will describe in more detail later in the presentation. These include an increase of 2.74 million as a result of comprehensive review of fees and charges, and an increase of 3.86 million reflecting revenue adjustments associated with county expenditure adjustments. Another half a million increase for our review of the indirect cost charges applied to other funds for the support that they receive from our central service agencies in the general fund. The lower half of the chart lists how we can utilize the projected revenue increase. Approximately 174 million is allocated to FCPS with most of that for operating support. County increases total approximately 178 million with 148 million of that for employee pay and benefits. Increases of approximately 12 million are also included for our required debt service payments and for transportation. <clears throat> the other priorities category on this slide includes the net expenditure impact of all other adjustments offset by reductions that have been identified in the general fund supported agencies. This category is broken out in the following slide. After all of our recommended adjustments, there is a balance of 3.8 million. <coughs> the pie chart on the left shows the allocation of new spending in the advertised budget, excluding the balance that we have set aside for the board's consideration. 49% of our projected resources are proposed to be allocated to Fairfax County Public Schools. Another 42 is allocated for employee pay and benefits. Increased support for Metro and Fairfax Connector account for about 4% and 3% is allocated for debt service. All other adjustments are broken out in the chart to the right, along with nearly 34 million in the offsetting expenditure reductions and account for just 2% of the overall increase in expenditures. As I noted earlier, this small 2% portion of new funding, excuse me, of new spending associated with all other adjustments in this budget is fully offset by fee adjustments, revenue enhancements, indirect cost chargebacks identified by county staff through a months long process. The following slides will provide more detail on each of these areas with highlights of some of the adjustments included in the budget, the advertised budget summary, which is posted online and included in your packets provides an exhaustive list of all adjustments and reductions proposed. <clears throat> the largest net increase included in the advertised budget is, is to support Fairfax County Public Schools. Like the county, the Fairfax County Public Schools superintendent focused, our, focused on employee compensation as part of her proposed budget. Her budget includes a 6% across the board salary adjustment for all FCPS employees, 
funding to support the ongoing cost of a 2% pay adjustment provided in January, a new defined, excuse me, a new deferred retirement option program for legacy employees, and over 46, month, 46 million in funding to address enrollment growth, student demographic changes. The budget also includes ongoing support for multi-year investments such as inclusive preschool expansion, JET recommendations, and fine and find and performing arts stipends. The superintendent's operating transfer request is an increase of $254 million, or approximately 10.5%. This is the largest school operating request by percentage since fiscal 2007, and the largest request in terms of dollars in our history. Based on other significant budgetary pressures, I have not been able to include full funding on the requests in my proposed budget. The advertised budget includes an operating transfer increase of $165 million, or 6.8%, leaving just over 89 million unfunded. As the superintendent noted during her presentation to the school board, the funding challenges facing FCPS are due to the severe underfunding of schools by the Commonwealth of Virginia. As the board has discussed several times, the recently released JLARC study noted that Virginia schools receive 14% less funding per pupil than the average across the entire country. With West Virginia as an example, providing 25% more funding per student. Funding Virginia schools at a national average would provide another $1,900 per student or approximately $345 million in additional funding. We have been sharing this information through our communication travel, communication channels to help our community understand the scope of this important issue. I hope our legislators will agree that a strong educational system is key to our economic successes and that the General Assembly will expand schools funding beyond the minimal funding contained in the governor's proposed budget. Borrowing additional state funding, fully funding the superintendent's request would require an additional three cent increase on the real estate tax rate. <clears throat> By far the biggest driver on the county increases is due to county compensation with the proposed pay and benefits increase totaling $148 million. This includes the necessary funding to implement pay adjustments outlined in the collective bargaining agreements presented in December when the board approved resolutions indicating its intent to allocate the necessary funding. As the board is aware, over the course of many months last year, the county worked with representatives of the Southern States Police Benevolent Association and the International Association of Firefighters to negotiate two collective bargaining agreements for our uniformed police officers, firefighters, and public safety communicators. The police agreement reflects a challenging market in which our police department must compete to recruit and retain employees and includes a 3% scale adjustment, married and longevity increases, including a 10-year longevity step and a 2% cost of living adjustment. The agreement for the Fire and Emergency Services Bargaining Unit, which includes employees in fire and rescue, as well as the Department of Public Safety Communications, includes a new redesigned pay plan, which eliminates longevity steps and holds, increases minimum pay, and includes a 3% scale adjustment. Both agreements include increases to various stipends and a full day holiday for Christmas Eve, which we propose to expand to all county employees with your approval. In alignment with budget guidance approved, approved by the board last year, I have included pay increases for non-representative employees that are consistent with our negotiated, negotiated agreements. These include performance and longevity increases for general fund county employees, as well as merits and longevities for non-represented uni uniform public safety employees. For uniform sheriff employees specifically, I have also included a new 10-year longevity step to encourage retention and boost salaries in the middle of the salary range. We have also fully funded the adjustments related to our annual benchmark studies to maintain competitive pay scales and ensure that we do not have specific job classes falling behind as compared to the market. 
Since fiscal year 2012, when the market rate adjustment was first calculated utilizing the current formula through fiscal year 2022, before supply chain issues from the pandemic began to spur inflation, the average calculated MRA was 1.86%. In the past three years, the average has jumped almost two and a half times to 4.52%. Even before the impacts of the pandemic, we saw fluctuations in the MRA calculation, ranging from 1.3% to 2.5%, which caused budgetary challenges. As those fluctuations make it difficult for budgeting, it also creates uncertainty for our employees. As we held our collective bargaining discussions with public safety unions, it became apparent that proposing an alternative to the MRA was necessary. Unable to guarantee funding of an MRA whose calculation in future years was unknown, we instead proposed and the unions accepted a 2% cost of living adjustment in many years of the contract. A standard COLA is in line with what we see in other jurisdictions, provides stability for our budget and allows employees to anticipate their pay increases in future years. Although I know further board discussions will be necessary regarding this issue, I felt it important to begin this conversation as part of this budget process. In that vein, <clears throat> I have not included funding for the full calculated MRA at 4.1%, and I'm proposing an increase of 2%. I have chosen to do this for fiscal reasons, as I am proposing shifting to the COLA model in future years to provide some predictability for our employees and for budget planning. Certainly from a fiscal perspective, this is a challenging budget that has required difficult decisions. I have included adjustments only when I believe that they were necessary to address inflationary impacts and workload increases and to make small investments toward board initiatives. Each of my proposed adjustments was contemplated with the knowledge that a tax increase would be required to balance this budget. I would be hard pressed to propose increasing the tax rate by, a, by an additional penny, which would be required to generate an additional 36 million necessary to fully fund an MRA. This board also includes, this budget also includes significant increases to support employee benefits, particularly for county defined benefit retirement plans. Over $31 million is included for required increases to the employer contribution rates for all three systems based on FY23 investment returns and remaining impact of smoothing in the returns for prior years. All three systems experienced returns well below the 6.75% assumed rate of return in fiscal 22, while only the uniform system exceeded that target rate in 23. It is county policy to fully fund actuarially determined contributions to the systems and making those investments is, cru is crucial to sustaining the strong financial position of our plants. <coughs> Excuse me. The proposed budget includes an increase of 20 and a half million to support county and schools debt service requirements. This includes debt payments resulting from last, year, last month's 350 million general obligation bond sale. January 2024 represents the second year at this level after the Board of Supervisors and School Board approved the recommendations in late 2021 from the Joint County School Capital Improvement Program Committee to gradually increase annual bond sales from $300 million to $400 million. The last increase to the full $400 million will occur as part of the January 2025 bond sale which with associated debt service payments included in fiscal 26 budget. The increase in our debt service payments is also attributable to the current interest rate environment. Last month the county sold its bonds at a rate of an interest rate increase of 3.27 percent. That rate is competitive given the existing market and is evidence of the strength of the county's triple triple A bond rating but is slightly higher than the 2.98% we received last year and far above the 1.23% received in January of 2021. So for comparison's sakes, our combined debt service obligation in fiscal 2025 would, re 
would be reduced by $6 million if we had been able to achieve the same 1.23 rate percent rate for the most recent bond sale. The table at the bottom of the slide shows our bond referendum plan. With more significant changes to the CIP proposed in the past two years, this year's CIP proposes fewer changes. First, we are recommending removing the Mount Vernon Police Station from the 2024 Public Safety Bond Referendum and pursuing EDA bonds for future financing. This facility is part of an ongoing master plan study underway to determine if co-location opportunities could be realized for police and fire stations, Sherwood Library, and other county facilities in the area. EDA bonds can provide flexibility in scheduling the project and braiding those funds with previously approved geo bonds for the fire station and library. Second, staff is recommending increasing the 2000 and 26 library referendum by two million to accommodate the Braddock District Board Office space as part of the renovation project. Lastly, on the pace of spending associated with previous 2014 road bond, we recommend eliminating the 2028 road bond referendum. EDA, EDA financing can be pursued with the ability to leverage commercial and industrial real estate tax funds to make debt service payments. With these changes, we anticipate that we will be able to increase bond sales to support parks projects from 25 to 30 million in fiscal 2027, two years earlier than originally anticipated. This will help alleviate some of the pressures associated with the proposed construction schedule for the Audrey Moore Rec Center. As the board is aware, Metro is facing significant budgetary pressures. With the FY25 budgetary shortfall initially projected at $750 million, WMATA has been pursuing a multitude of potential measures including fare increases, service reductions, shifting funding targeted for preventive maintenance to operations. The general manager's budget release in December outlined several budget scenarios with the impact to Fairfax County ranging from the increase of 39 million to almost 80 million. After applying estimated state aid and gas tax receipts, we estimated that the general fund impact would range roughly between 16 to $55 million. We've included a net increase of almost 37 in my proposed budget with a $10 million increase in general fund support with the remainder coming from applied state aid and gas tax revenues. As maintaining a strong rail and bus system is a regional priority, Metro funding has been a hot budget topic in our neighboring state and local jurisdictions, as well as the Virginia Assembly. Based on the preliminary financial commitments from, the D, from DC, Maryland, and Virginia, Metro released a budget, a revised budget, which included targeted service adjustments with no station closures and scaled back fare increases along with organizational cost reductions, including no salary increases for Metro employees for fiscal 25. Our advertised budget was developed before this revised budget was released. And as Virginia support and the final Metro budget numbers are still unknown, further adjustments may be necessary to meet our Metro requirements. As the state budget moves closer to approval and we learn more from WMATA, we will provide the board with updated budget figures when they become readily available. Similarly, we are awaiting more information regarding the ongoing negotiations with our contract vendor for the Fairfax Connector bus system. Our proposed package will ensure our valued Fairfax Connector employees are adequately compensated relative to regional comparators. Although we have included a modest contract rack, excuse me, although we have included a modest contract rate increase in our proposed budget, the final fiscal impact will not be known until negotiations are completed. I am hopeful that we will have more information and we will be able to include further adjustments as part of our FY25 add-on package prior to the budget adoption. As the fiscal outlook for FY25 began to come into focus, we realized that tough decisions would be required to balance this budget. 
As we have noted to the board as at the joint forecast meeting with the school board in November, we directed agencies to provide reduction options totaling 7% of their general fund budgets to provide savings to offset other required increases. As a result of this exercise, we've identified 36 million in net savings, including a reduction of 84 positions. While these actions may reduce agency year-end balances, they are not expected to have a considerable impact on agency operations or existing employees. A full listing of proposed reductions is included in the advertised budget summary. Reductions primarily focus on identified efficiencies and shifting costs of non-general fund sources with minimal number of full or partial program reductions. I'm incredibly proud of the work that our agencies put into this exercise, scrutinizing their programs and activities to determine where they could eliminate vacant positions, align budgets to actual spending, and utilize technology to generate savings. We had a robust conversations with our leadership to ensure that any recommended reductions would not negatively impact our existing employees or create operational challenges which could impact the services we offer to our residents. While agency reduction percentages vary, the average reduction proposed is 2% of the 36 million identified. A majority is attributable to expenditure reductions while a small portion is associated with increased revenue. The revenue is primarily due to additional resources of the Department of Taxation, Tax Administration, which are expected to improve business tax compliance and hopefully increase revenues. In addition, staff conducted a comprehensive review of an individual agency and program fees for, for potential adjustments. The proposed budget includes increases for many of them, which are listed in the advertised budget summary. Among those is an increase to zoning fees based on cost increases and revised fire marshal fees with a goal of achieving cost recovery between 90 to 100 percent. Both of those, as well as recommended adjustments to land development services fees, will be discussed in further during, excuse me, will be discussed in further detail as part of the Budget Land Use Policy Committee meeting on February 27th. Staff also having reviewed the indirect cost chargebacks to other Funds resulting in a net increase of a half a million in the amount transferred to the general fund. These charges are self-supporting fund reimbursements to the general fund for the support provided by central service agencies such as finance, human resources, and procurement. The savings and fee increases noted on this slide fully offset adjustments noted on the next two slides for all other priorities. As noted, I, as noted earlier, we have included an abbreviated list of adjustments on this slide. A full list of adjustments included in each of these categories can be found in the advertised budget summary. Following the same trend as last year, the second largest increase after employee paying benefits is to address inflationary impacts and contract rate adjustments. We've included net associated revenues, approximately 15 million to provide an average of 5% increase for most personal, personnel based contracts, particularly in health and human services agencies, but also where necessary in county agencies. This funding will help support our community nonprofit partners as they continue to face inflationary increases and compensation pressures. Funding has also been provided for some expenses which are not personnel based, including fuel, waste disposal, and information technology maintenance and software. In direct response to the board budget guidance approved with the FY24 budget and further the county's goal of expanding access to early childhood opportunities, this budget, this proposed budget includes targeted investments in several critical human services areas. Funding and positions have been provided to support the county's effort to create and preserve affordable housing. And we have also added baseline funding, <coughs> excuse me. We've also added baseline funding to support our hypothermia program following several years of increased resources allocated as part of our quarterly reviews. We have directed, redirected some of the savings identified in our reduction exercises to preserve 72, again, 72 early childhood slots which were originally funded 
from a federal community funding project in fiscal 2024. We have also included funding to continue initiatives begun as part of the begun as part of prior budget process were originally funded with federal stimulus dollars. This includes a second year of a two year phase in of funding for behavioral health system navigation program as part of Healthy Minds Fairfax. Baseline funding to, to sustain increased support for the TOPS program approved at carryover and continued support for positions at the health department's laboratory, which were initially supported by federal stimulus dollars. In line with the board direction, we've also included funding to become a certified My Brother's Keeper community. In total, we've included approximately 7.1 million for housing and human services initiatives net of revenue. Almost 7 million have been provided for investments in environmental and energy initiatives and other support for parks. Following the board's budget guidance, we have provided baseline funding to continue bamboo mitigation efforts at parks, at, at the park authority properties and provide support for forestry operations and high risk tree removals. Funding and positions are also included to support what is expected to be a multi-year effort to assist FCPA in its efforts to work towards county goals of achieving, achieving zero waste by 2030. Additional funding is included for general parks maintenance for over three million in new funding for FCPA. As part of the budget development process, we have also examined our athletic service fees first implemented in 2005. Diamond field and indoor gym fees have never been increased and rectangular field fees were increased in 2016 as part of the synthetic turf task force recommendations. In FY 2025, we are proposing to increase fees for diamond fields, indoor gym and rectangular field users, which will generate additional $0.7 million. The fee for non-county participants is also proposed to increase generating additional $0.4 million. Also, the $0.6 million will, which has traditionally been generated from the existing non-county fee and deposited in the general fund will be applied directly to athletic sports programs going forward. In total, 1.7 million additional resources generated by these cum cumulative actions will be used to support the increasing costs associated with turf field replacement, custodial support for indoor gyms, maintenance of all athletic fields, and youth sports scholarships. Finally, 3.4 million in annual park funding previously provided to the Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority through general obligation bonds have been moved out of the county's bond program. This will provide more bond capacity for other programs and allows more flexibility in being responsive to Nova Park's capital funding needs. While I, can, while I anticipate continuing to provide IT project funding as part of our quarterly reviews, as we have done for many years, I've also included five million in baseline funding to support ongoing improvements in our overall technology infrastructure. My goal is to further modernize our IT systems. As we develop an approach to improve and update our tax administration systems, it is imperative that we make the necessary investments to stabilize our current county network. Additional funds will be required in future years, especially as we incorporate emerging technologies and increase our use of artificial intelligence into our IT infrastructure architecture. Other adjustments include our proposed budget, in, excuse me, other adjustments included in our proposed budget include funding and positions to support new facilities and address workload issues. That includes additional support to the Office of Elections, particularly in the response of changing state requirements, new probation counselor positions in the general district court to assist those being diverted from incarceration to mental health treatment, a new position in the office of the sheriff to support IT needs and a civilian support position for the Lorton police station. <clears throat> Looking forward, we will continue to monitor our major revenue categories and keep track of general assembly actions to determine impacts on the FY25 budget. 
In April, we will submit an add-on package to the board with many suggested revisions to this proposal. We will have two upcoming budget committee meetings to discuss the budget in more detail with a joint meeting with the school board scheduled from one week from today. At the following, at the following meeting on March 12th, we will provide an overview of our proposed capital improvement program and preview of the third quarter review. It is important to note that the additional increases beyond the proposed four cents would be required to fully fund the superintendent's proposed budget, school operating transfer, as well as to provide flexibility in meeting the county's metro and connector obligations which remain to be finalized. I encourage the board to advertise a real estate tax rate increase above the four cent increase upon which the budget is balanced to allow for and encourage engagement of our residents in the discussion on the budget challenges facing Fairfax County. This year, we are expanding the options that the public has to participate in our budget process. We can now receive feedback on the budget by text, email, or voicemail, and the feedback form on our website now has Spanish and Korean options. As in prior years, the residents can provide written or video testimony or participate in the April public hearing by phone or in person. We will also be updating our list of board member budget town halls posted on our budget website as they are scheduled. This presentation and all associated budget documents are now available on www.fairfaxcounty.gov backslash budget. This is the favorite part of my discussion. This is the last slide. The last slide provides the upcoming timeline for the FY25 budget. The board will take, no act, will take action to advertise the budget and tax rates on March 5th. Public hearings begin on April 16th. Ultimately, the board will mark up the budget on April 30th, followed by adoption on May 7th. I do want to say thank you for your time and attention this morning. I want to remind the board that the budget questions can be submitted to the Department of Management and Budget as part of our normal budget Q&A process. Otherwise, at this juncture, I am happy to entertain any questions you may have, and I do want to thank the budget staff because um, we've been working pretty hard trying to get us to this point. So any questions you have, I'm more than welcome to try and answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hill, uh, for your budget presentation, and also thank the budget staff, as you acknowledge, who have put a lot of work in uh, to the presentation. Um, we're going to open it up for any questions, but be before we do that, I just want to highlight a couple things. And one, um, at this time, normally uh, board members share their budget town hall uh, dates uh, with the public, but as the county executive acknowledged, there's also going to be uh, that information widely spread. Uh, by OPA and, and by the Budget Office. Um, I would also uh, suggest and, and thank uh, our staff uh, for the new ways in which people can provide uh, input, including language access opportunities. And, and you know, clearly, uh, we're going to hear a lot uh, from the public, from our employees, from other stakeholders about this budget process, and, and we want that. Uh, we want as much feedback as possible. So I, I do want to thank you for increasing the platforms by which people can uh, weigh in and, and that language access piece. Um, I also want to thank you for the uh, efficiencies that, that are in here. Um, I know that was an internal exercise uh, that the board was not involved in and, and that caused some uh, concerns uh, among some of our agencies, some of our employees, but clearly uh, having just heard the budget presentation, the attention to that and the prediction uh, that that would be necessary is appreciated and we'll of course go through those uh, all those reductions as you said that are outlined in detail uh, in this proposal uh, but it is nice as a beginning point to have those options here uh, to have those uh, that 36 million dollars and 84 positions uh, that have been eliminated that were vacant uh, giving us an opportunity to be more efficient uh, as a county government especially as we uh, have learned a lot of things through the pandemic about different ways to do business, uh, different ways to be data informed, and, and I look forward to looking at those. And thank you for putting those uh, in your in your presentation. Um, you know, lastly, I, I will just say uh, for for myself, and and you know, I know the rest of the board. Uh, the public may not be aware of this, but this is the first time we're seeing this presentation, and so this is all new information to us. Uh, we have a lot of time. 
uh, to be able to digest this and, and to hear uh, feedback from all of our stakeholder groups and our county residents. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, this is the beginning of what is a very long uh, budget process. We work on budget all year, uh, but today myself, uh, my colleagues are hearing uh, this presentation for the first time as the public is. And so uh, we may not all have reactions to it at this point in time. We're absorbing uh, the information, uh, but look forward to engaging uh, the public as we move forward. Um, I, I would characterize this as an expected difficult budget. Uh, we've known throughout the year uh, we had a uh, meeting with the school board recently where revenue projections uh, for fiscal forecast was shared uh, we knew that uh, we were pointing towards uh, red uh, in in what you know the expectations for our community are and what the revenue available would be to meet those expectations and so uh, subsequent to that time uh, the school board has put in a request for us for a transfer uh, which I, I personally find to be entirely unrealistic, um, but I do appreciate uh, what you've done in this budget in terms of addressing some significant uh, school needs. And as you mentioned, we'll be having a joint meeting uh, with our colleagues on the school board next week as we try to hash through this. Um, lastly, I'm just gonna emphasize something that you emphasize, because I don't know that it can be emphasized enough, uh, which is we were down last week to the General Assembly uh, meeting with our partners in Richmond. And I hope a major takeaway of this budget presentation uh, for our general public is the lack of state support that we get for public education. Um, a huge driver in their increase is not inefficiency of FCPS. A huge driver in their increase is a lack of state funding to support public education. And I have said from this dais before, I will say it again, it is an, a national embarrassment uh, that Virginia underfunds public education and that we are trailing all of our neighboring states, including West Virginia and Kentucky. That is an embarrassment, uh, a stain on Virginia's reputation. And I hope uh, that the General Assembly begins to address that. As you pointed out in your presentation, uh, the average we're underfunding pupils, and we know it's a much higher number than this in Fairfax County because of our support of public education, but the average is $1,900 per pupil, and that would generate in Fairfax County $345 million. So I want to be crystal clear to the public. We would have $345 million more to invest in all the priorities we just heard from if the state simply met the national average for public education funding. And I think our kids are worth more than the national average. And much of the conversation that we're gonna have over the next couple months about this budget is based on that underfunding amount. That's a lot of money, $345 million. And so I, I can't emphasize this enough because we've sat here many years and talked about underfunding of public education. And this JLARC study that came out this year that points to actual figures and shows us where we are nationally uh, should be a call to action for everybody. And at the end of the day, because of that $345 million, as this budget shows, there's increased stress and strain on property owners, residential property owners in the county. And the county executive has proposed a four cent increase. That four cent increase, if you look at the amount of pennies, is 100 and 130 million dollars that generates 130 million dollars and we are underfunding the state public education by 345 million dollars so the entirety of that tax increase is more than overtaken by that underfunding that has been proposed and so I, I want our residents to understand that difficult position that we're in because as we see in this budget over 50 percent of our budget is a transfer to the school system and when you start in the hole as bad as we do in Virginia, that revenue has to come from somewhere. And it puts strain on every other thing that we need to do in the county, from public safety to human services to affordable housing, all the other priorities, parks, environment that are in here, are strained from that starting point. And I think this is a, a moment in time where we can't state that enough, and certainly in a difficult budget year, it, it, it is very clear uh, what the challenges are out there and where they begin. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to turn to my colleagues to see if folks have any questions. They want to announce a town hall meeting date, um, and again, stress that we have uh, several committee meetings. 
uh, several town halls uh, and a lot of ways for people to provide input uh, as we move through this process for the next couple months. And so at this time, I'll entertain, uh, Mr. Hill will entertain any questions that board members have. Let me start with Supervisor Lusk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hill, for your presentation. Um, I'm looking at slide eight, um, and I'll say it certainly is maybe a little concerning, but I guess we'll have to see in terms of what happens over time. But if we look at um, the first category under um, the equalization chart here, it says apartments, and the apartments are down a little more than two plus percent here, and just trying to get a sense of um, what's the, is there any thought about what is driving that number first, and then I'll have a, a follow-up as well. Well, what I'm going to say is um, we are working tirelessly to try to figure out what is driving uh, many of these numbers, obviously, right. with your equalization rates and uh, property value decline in those large entities. Um, we're working with tax administration to come up. So that's going to be like one of those Q&As that we will okay. do a little bit more forensic science on. Yeah, j just curious. I mean, yeah. I know we're doing a lot of additional residential construction, particularly in the apartments category, and just trying to understand what is the, the, the issue as it relates to 2024 versus our projection for 2025. So that can be a Q&A question. That's perfectly fine. If I can move then further down on the chart, and this one is one I know um, others are probably have the same concern, and that's under the office elevator. So just acknowledging that we've got a pretty substantial reduction there if we could understand I, I think we are not probably seeing that level of reduction along the high valued uh, silver line properties but just trying to get a sense of where are we uh, projecting this uh, reduction which markets uh, which type uh, I know it's elevator but quality uh, a b c what's the, the the class of building just trying to understand the specifics there. And then if I could drop down to the low rise, it would be the same sort of question. Just try to understand what markets and the class of space. And then last, what is our sense about this? Because I, I think when I look at our direct vacancy and our sublet vacancy numbers, they really haven't changed that much, which is good. But I guess the question to me is that when I look at the office market, we have these buildings that have leases that are seven year, 10 year, and sometimes even higher. Yeah. Yeah. So as those leases are rolling, this is gonna be the question I think, mm -hmm. is that are we gonna see that compression in the utilization of the space? I think that's been the, the question mark mm -hmm. from the beginning. And for me personally, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm definitely concerned about it because I think this is where the softening is and this is where the, the issue could be. So just trying to get a sense of kind of how you see that going forward. Um, and then um, any thoughts? Clearly, if this is the harbinger of things to come, <laughs> what is the response? How do we approach this and what are the um, maybe remedies? that we would suggest? I'll, I'll just start by saying this, and I'll, I'll let um, Christina or Phil um, interject as well. Um, we've been working with Victor Hoskins and EDA to understand the compression situations that are going on with those categories. Um, we really have a chart, and we do know where uh, the lower, uh, the values are going or being devalued. We know where, what districts, what types of buildings. Uh, that is uh, associated with part of our push to move forward with a diversification of our, of our economy. Um, what I will say to you is that we will provide you exactly where the values are declining. You made an interesting point about the leases, the 7, the 10, and the 15, and actually 20 years. As those roll off, those markets or those buildings are no longer valued as high because they can't return the rent because we're building, as I stated in this presentation, a million square feet along the silver line. Um, that space is going to be snapped up quickly. 
which will create situations in areas other and around our county that will be then vacant. And we have to figure out ways to fill those spaces, albeit whether it is converting or doing something different on that plot of land. I think um, we have done a pretty good job in certain areas of revitalizing those areas, but we need to do more. And I, you'll see that in my eval that I wrote the last two years, actually, that we were starting to address that. Uh, Victor, Victor Hoskins in the EDA has been working tirelessly with that. Our Department of DEI has been working tirelessly with that. Um, so we're, we're working on it. The question is how do we get more folks to come here and be a part of our community? No, no, I, I appreciate that and I'll look forward to seeing the, the Q&A responses and I think, you know, this is something we're certainly going to have to get our arms around and really completely understand. And then if I could, Mr. Chairman, one last point is on slide uh, 14. We talked about Fairfax Connector and you made a point that we are still in negotiations on what the cost structure might be here. Just out of curiosity, what the request that has been made specifically as it relates um, to this item, what is the value of the request that has been made? Ooh, I don't have that top of my head. All right, I have to do, I have to send that in a budget Q&A. Okay. I don't have that off the top of my head. All right, no problem. I appreciate your responses, and I'll look forward to those um, answers. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Walkinshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, agree with your remarks. Obviously, it's a difficult budget. Appreciate the great work that, that staff has done, even if I don't love everything that I've heard. Um, one, before I forget, our, our Braddock District Budget Town Hall will be Monday, March 11th at 7 p.m., um, on channel 16 as well as streamed on my uh, Facebook page. Um, just following up on uh, Chairman McKay's comments about JLARC and he articulated it so I won't go through all of it. The only thing I will add is um, in the budget bills uh, that have been released in both the Senate and the House with respect to teacher pay, the Senate includes a 3% pay raise mm. for teachers and the House bill includes a 3.375% pay raise for teachers. And I'll make two points with respect to that. One, uh, those are probably the high watermark of what will come uh, out of the process. The governor's budget, I think, was a 1% and 2% perhaps pay raise. So between the negotiation that occurs with the, general, with the House, the Senate, and then ultimately the governor, I find it hard to believe that they're going to end up higher than 3% with a state pay raise for teachers. And then, as we all know, it's also very important to remind people that the General Assembly or the governor signing a 3 or 3.37 percent pay raise for teachers does not mean that they are funding a 3 or 3.375 percent pay raise for teachers in Fairfax County. What it means is they're making a down payment of roughly 20 percent um, and ask us to, to fund the rest of it. Uh, so the 6 percent uh, that is in the uh, superintendent's um, budget, as important as, as, it, as it is, and we all know that that's important, it is almost double what even the most generous uh, pay raises that the General Assembly is considering. Um, significant difference there. Um, two points. Uh, one, I appreciate the work that's been done on on fees to make sure that we're looking holistically at all our fees. That's something that, that I have been asking about. Uh, I, I will reiterate that maybe this year's budget and maybe budget guidance provides us an opportunity to make sure that we have a policy and a timeline for when and how we look at those fees. Uh, because we don't want people to feel like it's arbitrary or when we need money, uh, we're raising fees and you want to have predictability in it. So I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if it's three years, five years, different fees on a different timeline. I think it would be valuable for us to have a policy and a timeline uh, for all of those fees. And, and final point, the investment returns, obviously the $28.57 million um, needed to increase retirement um, contribution rates on slide 12 is a big, big number. Um, I had a budget Q&A uh, about lo looking at the uh, 
respective systems and their returns. I asked for them relative to the S&P 500. Somebody smarter than me also included the median public plan returns. Mm -hmm. And what jumped out at me, and, and look, obviously you don't want to evaluate investment returns based on one year. But it is very striking that in FY23, uh, ERS, Employees Retirement System, returned negative 1.8%. POR's police officers retirement system, negative 3.7%. The median public plan was 9.3% in FY23. Mm -hmm. So that's a dramatic difference. Um, so, so maybe as a follow-up to my previous budget q and I'd like to get a narrative explanation of that difference. Why are they so far behind, at least in FY23? Are they looking better since FY23? And I'd like to know if they had met the median public plan for, not, uh, for FY23, mm -hmm. what would that $28.57 million be mm -hmm. uh, in, in this year's proposal? Thank you. Well, okay. Dave. Mr. Hill, do you want to respond? Uh, it's interesting that you, uh, you state that, Supervisor Walkinshaw. I had a, another um, board member, i.e. chairman, and I talked about that last night. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that is a Q&A that's already been queued up, but I do appreciate your, um, you looking into that. And I believe that uh, there will be a proposal, well, there'll be an answer to the question as well as potential solution to your questions forthcoming. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. And, I, and <clears throat> I, I would just suggest that this, this is an area that I think is gonna get a wholesale look. Uh, not just the returns, but also the fees, the structures um, of our retirement systems, because it is glaring uh, what was just mentioned, um, and it does require a, a much more thorough investigation, including obviously the bottom line numbers, but then also are we structured properly? Are we most efficient? Uh, are our fee structures correct? Uh, some of those things that I think will involve uh, will, might, might necessarily involve even an outside uh, look so that we're getting the best information that we can on that, on that point. Yeah, I, and, and I thank you for that question last year. It was a good question last year. It's a great question again this year. Um, I think if we, if we could get a five-year look back and a 10-year and a 15, that's typically what you do when you're kind of like analyzing those returns because you can get wild fluctuations. But I think we're going to see the same thing. And I think it points to uh, the work that needs to get done. But I think having that 5, 10, and 15-year look back as well would be very, very helpful. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Smith. I just want to follow up on the fees. The county executive did mention it. February 27th, the land use policy meeting. We will be talking about the land development services, uh, zoning ordinance, and fire marshal fees. And part of the issue we face is sometimes it's 10, 12 years before we, 15 years before we look at this. And my budget town hall is coming up quickly on February 29th from 7 to 9. We are going to do it in person at Rocky Run Middle School in the lecture hall. And so I hope that a lot of the public will come out and we can have a great discussion. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Smith. Supervisor Palchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and th thank you, Mr. Hill, and uh, the entire budget team and county staff for their work on this. Uh, let me start off with my uh, budget town hall, always joint with our school board members, and I believe we have our CFO will be joining us virtually on Tuesday, April 2nd at 5.30 p.m. on both Channel 16 and Facebook Live. Uh, definitely look forward to that conversation. Um, and then just a couple of follow-on questions uh, since we're here today. I know this is the beginning and we're just looking through this. Uh, number one, I really want to thank you in here. Uh, clearly, it's been over 40 years since we have collective bargaining in this county. And so definitely the investments um, and want to congratulate you and your staff for, a, I think, a very productive first collective collective bargaining agreements with two of our agencies and knowing that our general county employees do not yet have collective bargaining I appreciate uh, from what I'm reading today that we are generally following similar guidelines um, as we did in those other agreements so as that continues to move forward and I know our employees are collective are actively working on the collective bargaining agreements that we continue to ensure that for all of our employees uh, number two I do note that quite a bit is brought up about the state budget 
and I know there will be more questions around that. Uh, number one, and I think as Supervisor Walkinshaw mentioned and, and the Chairman and others, um, not only uh, are, is our state underfunding schools, but when we hear those percentages of the increase, whether it's one, two, three, or more percent from the state, we know that means a very different thing for our county. Um, so a couple of specific questions, um, because we know the per pupil funding here at the state level is very, very small compared to what we, we are doing. Number one, I don't know if we have additional information on what we do see, which would be increases on caps for support positions, if that's been included in the state, um, in the state budgets, the Senate and the, and the House of Delegates, um, and any other funding that follows specific students, which is really, I think, was Jay Lark is recommending and that we've seen for years is our students uh, who are receiving special services for special needs, for ESOL, um, and our students living uh, in poverty, if we could get additional information on that from the state budgets. Uh, I know that continues to change, but I think that's what we really look at at the bottom line of what we get from the state that we don't have to fund locally. Um, number two, as was brought up quite a bit on the transit and transportation issues, um, I know we are looking and waiting to see final numbers for Metro, but also for our um, Fairfax connector, uh, as well as other transportation needs that we know we care about here in the community, whether it be sidewalks and trails or other improvements locally. Um, I think my question there uh, really is the latest I saw, the Senate budget includes nothing for Metro. Um, and that's not just unfortunate, but disappointing, because that doesn't mean that we're not going to fund Metro. It means that here locally we're going to be funding Metro, and the state's not going to be supporting that. And that will be taken away from our schools and other budget priorities. So um, if we could get any updates we have now on um, the transportation uh, recommendations or as they move forward uh, at the state level, um, knowing that we can't not fund Metro. It has to get funded um, because it is so important here. And then finally, um, I was reading through this and I think there was information in the details on the capital improvement program. And we're always looking at areas that can be shifted from baseline budget to one-time funds. I believe there, there's not a page number yet, but I believe there's information here about only part of the capital program, 13.1 million, maybe 2.5, some more being funded here versus being left for carryover funds. Um, if I'm reading that correctly, I just want to make sure we can look at anything in a tight budget that can be shifted from the baseline budget, programmatic budget, to um, possible year-end or one-time funds. I think I read that correctly. I, please correct me if I did not, um, if we are looking at those recommendations. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I quite know what you might be talking about. I know that right now we have two and a half million in the baseline mm -hmm. for both the county and the schools related to those joint CIP recommendations. Our goal was to try to get to at least $10 million in additional pay down money on both sides. Right now we're just at two and a half each. Right. So that, that might be that two and a half million that re you're referencing, but we can certainly follow back up with you and make sure we're addressing the appropriate question. Okay, yeah, I was looking at the full list of the 25 general fund supported capital program um, 32 million, and then be, before that, it was talking about not fully funding that through the 25 budget. So I think just um, any clarity on that, on what is being funded through yeah. the 25 budget, yeah. and then are there areas that could be considered for? I do think tax? that we have an outstanding Q and A right now related to where we stand on the recommendations that came out of that joint CIP committee, and so I think that that uh, response will tie into your question right. because really we would have liked to have included more in terms of pay down funding in this budget, but we have not moved off that uh, two and a half yeah. again, yeah. five total, two and a half county, two and yeah. a half schools in the 25 proposal. Oh, excellent. Thank you. That will be very helpful. Very much appreciate it. Okay. Supervisor Alcorn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I will be hosting a couple of town halls for public input uh, on the proposed budget. Uh, first is going to be March 20th at 7 p.m. in person uh, in Vienna at a location TBD, but that will be posted. Uh, and then on March 25th, I'll be having a virtual meeting as well. Um, I do have a couple of questions 
thank you for, uh, Mr. Chairman, for you and others flagging the JLARC issue uh, with schools. This is a major concern um, I know we all have. I did want to build on something uh, Supervisor Palchik just asked about in terms of WMATA. And um, does, the, does the budget increase that we're showing for the local portion of WMATA, does that assume $65 million, which is in the House budget, or no? It does not. Okay, so. This uh, is why I asked to give you some flexibility. Yeah. Um, to see if we, if we get everything from the House, and obviously then we don't need, and the Senate, we don't need to, to, to raise base on As the much. MATA, but if there's a, a delta, we need to figure out what the delta is and how we deal with it. Okay, thank you. And I just want to remind everybody too, you know, when, I mean, thank you House, <laughs> you know, for that, that budget uh, proposal. But even that, even that is a $1 per $1 match uh, required by local government. So right. when we see $65 million coming in from, even if the House uh, gets its way in the budget, that's still an additional $65 million from local governments in Northern Virginia. And that means mostly us uh, in Fairfax County. Yeah, that, so. is, that is correct. Uh, 10 million of it would be Loudoun. And then there's percentage calculations, and we are probably half of that remaining. So, yeah, yes, it's a it's a very interesting calculation. Yes, it is, uh, and one that I hope uh, Senator Eben's study committee will be taking a serious look at uh, because this structure is uh, very problematic. I think uh, for all of us, and has been for a long time. Um, a couple other quick questions. Um, the Animal Protection Police, is that change included in the proposed budget? Uh, Christina Jackson, um, the only change that we've included, and I'll let Tom Arnold elaborate, is moving one position from the police department to the Department of Animal Sheltering to create a new deputy director position, which would be the chief ACO, I'm probably getting the title wrong. Yeah. Um, so moving one position, we know that we still have some more work to do on that total reorg. We would expect to see further kind of more major movement as part of the FY26 budget. So okay. there's a really small piece in the FY25 okay. budget. Okay, uh, we might just reduce the number of speakers uh, coming to the budget hearing. So I uh, just wanted to make sure I didn't see it in there. So I just wanted to confirm that. So thank you very well, much. Just just to be yes, just please. to be clear on, on that point though, the, the reason for that position is to to begin the process, the okay. process so of it is converting. In so in a way, the first part. it is very much in there because that's a first step that would be necessary to do the conversion that's been, been spoken about. And so while the conversion itself might not physically happen until the next budget year, the process towards that begins in this budget year should we adopt it the way it's been proposed. And I just want to just be really clear about how we, we message that because I think Thank it's important. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for making that clarification because, yeah, I think uh, this is something we are going to hear uh, a lot uh, from folks about um, and maybe some budget questions coming in on that too. Thank you. Um, my last question is on the 2% MRA for uh, general county employees. Um, I am a little disappointed, it's, it's, but I understand. I think my, my question is, um, for each 1% of the MRA, I think I saw in the summary, is that about $12 million per 1% MRA? Uh, that could be a budget question too. Yeah, I think it's closer to 15. But, closer to um, 15, Yeah, okay. but, but, but we'll do the math because now yeah. that some of the employees are over in the, represent the collective bargaining. Right, yeah. yeah, okay. The numbers have changed. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. And you know, if I, if I could, uh, pile on to that because I think for us, for clarity, it'll be, it'll be helpful. Uh, the county executive mentioned that we might be shifting from a, you know, to a COLA model away from a market rate adjustment model, and I am sure uh, that will engender a lot of questions as to what that actually means. And so, what would be helpful for us uh, in a budget Q and A, not necessarily to do here, but describe to us what that would look like, and maybe go back in time and apply if we had been using the methodology for a COLA versus an MRA, say, over the past 10, 15 years, 
uh, what would that have looked like? Because I, I understood from the presentation that that transition is partly driven by the conversations that we've been having as a part of the collective bargaining agreement. And so um, I think it's important for us to know, you know, what does that actually mean in terms of compensation? The, the model that was described, um, one of the highlights of it was predictability. Uh, better predictability than the market rate adjustment. And so for our employees, that'll mean, you know, well, what does that look like over a time horizon? Because it's one thing to be predictable. It's another to be made whole uh, by comparison of the two. And the roller coaster of the MRA, no matter how you calculate it, uh, might not be in the best long-term financial planning interests of our employees. And so I think it would be helpful for us at, if you could hash that out a little bit better in a little bit more detail as we, you know, progress through this budget, what that would look like. Um, the only other point I'm going to make, um, and, and it's in response to a question that Supervisor Alcorn had and a response from the county executive about flexibility. I just want to be crystal clear because there's a lot of confusion about this. On March 5th, this board will advertise a tax rate. Right. That advertised tax rate would be the highest tax rate by law that we could adopt a budget based on. And so that's in a matter of two weeks. And so between now and the next two weeks, we'll be deciding just the advertised tax rate. That does not equate into what the budget will be or what the final tax rate will be. But when we talk about flexibility, and the county executive has suggested flexibility, not knowing what's going to happen in Richmond uh, in terms of budget, not knowing what's going to happen with Metro, that's the flexibility you were talking about is that when we go advertise, we have to know going into that conversation that we are advertising the highest possible tax rate that can even be considered. Not likely to be adopted, but could even be considered in, the, in light of the fact of those uncertainties that were mentioned. And I just want to make that clear because a lot of people don't understand, mm -hmm. you know, how that works and why we advertise a rate um, and why we cannot go any higher than that rate when it comes time for budget adoption in a couple months. Supervisor Stork. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I particularly want to kind of add my voice to the questions, concerns um, about uh, better funding for schools and, and the JLARC proposals and the fact that we are near the bottom in terms of state funding for schools, but yet Fairfax County is near the top in terms of how we fund our schools. We've taken that seriously. I've taken that seriously during my 20 years of public service, not on the school board, but also Board of Supervisors. And I recognize that that is a core part of, I think, the value added to being a resident of Fairfax County. My challenge is that the, the recommendation this year from the superintendent is, I think, is, is far beyond what is affordable. And clearly, I appreciate the kind of executive's um, recommendation that's in here. I'm not sure that that's, um, that's affordable either, but I'm happy to take a look at that. Uh, but I have, I have deep concerns about that as well. And my, general advice as a former school board member and now board supervisor member is urge the school board to take a very 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 hard look at their budget and look for ways that they can uh, dramatically reduce and shift resources uh, obviously we'll always want those to go in the classroom but, but clearly uh, they're going to have some tough decisions to make because i know that we have some very tough decisions here um, I have a question in general. I know it's not, uh, mostly it's not in the, um, the, the general uh, operating budget, but, but the transit occupancy tax and the information for that, looking forward to seeing where that is. And I looked in here quickly. I, I just had a chance to look at the proposals uh, this morning, so I don't know if, I, if it's specifically in there, and, but I'm looking for that. And then I wanted to ask a question about the hotels. Maybe it's a budget question, because we've seen that the, the hotel uh, valuations went down dramatically a few years ago, COVID, obviously, they've been creeping back up. Where are we now? And wanted to overall have some additional information on that. So are you asking for the value of the hotels or are you asking for the TOT? I'd like to see over back? time. Over time? Okay. It, where, where are we? I mean, I know what's the core, what is the value? Because it, it went down 44% and it's gone up okay. 20% and kind of where are we in general? And, and is that a starting to hit a more positive tone. I know we have office elevator that's still in deep trouble, and, and at least in our some of our areas, obviously our newer um, buildings are doing better, but I, I need to understand that better. Okay. I want to see how that may be affected around the county. I know some of that I'll see that when we get our revenue presentations 
but uh, in, but just would, would get an overall review of where that's been sure. over the last, let's say, five or ten years. Sure, we can. We have a chart for that. We can we can help you with that. And then transit occupancy tax. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to take a look at that, and and I I can't recall if we're at our maximum rate on that or not. So I I I, I definitely want to take a look at okay. that and see how we should uh, take take it further. I think we have an opportunity there. I know others around here uh, charge more than we do, and it's I think uh, uh, at least a little bit of money that might make a difference for us. So okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Harity. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, start by announcing before I forget my uh, budget town hall will be March 12th at 7 o'clock. Um, and we're going to do that virtually. Always a lot of people like in person, but virtually we get so many more people, so we've opted to go with the virtual format. I want to again start by thanking staff for, uh, for pulling this all together. It was a lot of work finding $36 million in reductions and, and all that that went into. I know that's not an easy nor a fun uh, nor a fun thing to do uh, and I know this is the county executive's budget it's not anywhere near final um, but it includes a 7% increase roughly on our average homeowner assessments up 2.86% and a four and a four cent uh, what do you call it four cent tax increase if it stays there and of course that doesn't include um, the, the schools full requests and I with Dan I think schools have got a lot of work to do there and it doesn't include Metro um, let me start my questions with with um, with Metro the Metro funding formula is that being going to be or has has it been adjusted by um, based on ridership ratios between the jurisdictions because I understand our ridership is not, and when is it scheduled to happen? Is that a whole can of worms that I just <laughs> opened that you're, is that better, a, a better a budget question or is that? Well, it, it really is better a budget Q&A because I will have to look also at the Metro budget, which has changed slightly. Yeah. Um, I do not believe that I could answer your question in the affirmative. Uh, predicated on what uh, information I've received from Metro at this state, at this okay. juncture. Okay. Um, as I'm looking through the presentation on slide three, just generally, and it's not really the economy, but it, it kind of is. But, um, you know, domestically, more people are leaving Fairfax than coming to Fairfax. And I think that's kind of, that's, I think that's an important point as we go into this budget to to keep in mind on a broad overall perspective. So I think it, at some point, um, the $36 million in reductions, I, and I haven't had a chance to look at the budget package. Are those detailed yes, in sir. here? Okay, I assume, I assume they were, but I wanted to make sure. I assume the list of fee increases is detailed in yes, here sir. as well. Mm -hmm. So no, no question there. Um, the... Trying to read my writing here. Uh, transfers in on page 15. Is it clear what funds those transfers in came from? The, the 0.48 million? Yes, sir. In indirect, which could you share? It's in the advertised budget. Yeah, we'll send you the link. All right. Just wanted to make sure that that is all in there. Uh, so I, you know, I think I'm, you know, when I, this budget to me, I mean, I'm going to start where I left off last year. With all due respect to our new board members, I'm going to start where I left off last year. I seven percent at the bottom, hopefully blower, is is unsustainable. Um, it's it's unfortunately not surprising, but it's disappointing that we're here. I mean, as as the board knows, for the last several years, um, I've asked that we go adopt budget language to form either a citizen review committee, some kind of deep dive into the budget as been done under Chairman Hanley, Chairman Davis, Chairman Bulla, Bulova have all done it. Uh, the lone exception of those boards was under Chairman Connolly and taxes doubled during the eight years that, uh, that he was here. The school boards already agreed to do that deep dive. And, and I 
commend them for at least embarking on that process. We'll see what comes out of it. But, you know, we, we need to be tracking our spending commitments. We say we work on the budget all year, but what we do is work on the spending side of the budget all year. We really need to, to get that budget review committee, and I hope this board will get there. I hope this board will take longer than the next two months to take a deep dive. It, it, you know, the pandemic has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. It's looking at efficiencies, and I appreciate the effort you did to look for savings, but I think the board needs to really look at what results are we getting for what we spend mm -hmm. and making sure that we're spending that officially, you know, efficiently. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, um, but we got a short window to do it with, and uh, yeah. I look forward to working with you to see what we can do to, to make this palatable to our taxpayers. I appreciate those comments. Uh, again, if you look at the budget, uh, 148 million of the 178 that we requested is in compensation. Um, as you know, we've had some significant issues in retaining and attracting our staff. Um, I believe that moving forward with the 148 is going to allow us to be um, better positioned for employees. However, uh, I do take your words with, um, I do take your words and we'll look into seeing how we can become even more efficient than we have been. Um, the 36 million that we've um, re removed from the budget for operational efficiencies is our first pass. Obviously, this is not a, uh, something that you can do in one year, um, but it is something that we're going to look at over a period of time. But again, the, the 148 out of the 178, I think we, we've asked for is, uh, is all about compensation and keeping on board and keeping on track with our comparators. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Supervisor Jimenez and then Supervisor Bierman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Hale and staff for, for this presentation. I know you put a lot of hard work into this. Uh, we will be announcing our, our in-person town hall later this week in Mason District, which I'm very excited to be doing. Uh, one quick question for you, Mr. Hill, is you mentioned the importance of revitalization and bringing businesses to certain parts of the district. Obviously, uh, Mason District in, in certain parts is prime for revitalization. You talked about looking at ideas to bring in businesses to generate revenue. Can you talk a little bit, though, about the retention of those businesses within Fairfax County? Are we having success when it comes to keeping the businesses that come to Fairfax County here? I will say this. As you know, sir, um, Supervisor Jimenez, thank you for the questions. As you know, 93% of our businesses are 50 people or less. And what I've seen through BPOL um, from the fiscal 22 and 23 is an increase in BPOL taxes, which means one of two things, businesses are growing or we are gro or their gross receipts are growing or both. Um, we have a, a plan that we're going to be articulating to you, especially specific to Bailey's Crossroads. Um, the Department of Economic Initiatives has done an excellent job in reaching out. And as you know, we have three or four that we have contacted to come to Mason District. Um, can't really say who they are, what they're doing right now, but um, we are very poised in trying to ensure that each and every one of our magisterial districts are going to get um, more business opportunities. I believe Supervisor Smith was at a groundbreaking on Tuesday. Um, we had a committee meeting. She told me I could not go with her, but she, but she was there. Those are the types of things we're trying to do is bring those smaller businesses back into Fairfax County. Again, 93% or 50 or less people in the county. And this is what we're really targeting. And that is one of the reasons why we created, you created, the Board of Supervisors created the Department of Economic Initiatives led by uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Maldry. So those are the types of things we're trying to tie in because I believe diversification was, is not something you can do over a day or two. It's, it's gonna take some time. And in working with the EDA, uh, Victor Hoskins and team, we are working to bring in more diverse businesses to our county. Uh, as you and I have spoken on several occasions, uh, we're targeting the Mason districts under your, under your leadership because you have asked me on several occasions uh, to look at certain properties, especially in Bailey's Crossroads and Seven Corners, and that's where we're moving forward towards. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hill. And being the cultural hub of Fairfax County, we're very excited to start welcoming new businesses in Mason District. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Supervisor Bierman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, County Executive Hill. Thank you to the budget team for all the work that you've done. Uh, I wanted to touch on, you, you sort of almost stole my thunder with what, when you were talking about uh, county employees. I think this, this is a really challenging year uh, because oftentimes when you have uh, lower revenue growth, uh, you're in an employer's market and not an employee's market. Um, I was going back and looking at some budget task force documents from uh, my predecessor, John Faust, back to the Great Recession. In many years when the Delta and the Gulf was far, far bigger uh, than it is today, but also in those years you did not have a situation where uh, we were also losing or hemorrhaging employees potentially if we did not provide uh, the necessary increases. I, I find it surprising, and so I'm, I, I have to be wrong, but I think I may be, I, I know James was on the Hill, but I may be the only former federal government employee up here, am I? I Oh, there we go. Okay, good, good. The new guys. Um, but, but, but yeah, looking back to years where we were dealing with, you know, the federal government was in sequestration. Here we're looking at situations where the federal government is actually raising their empl uh, employee compensation as well. So I, I think that puts us in a unique position where uh, we have to continue to be uh, competitive. Now, Supervisor Alcorn uh, stole my question about uh, uh, what uh, fully funding the MRA would be. I think it's, you had said an additional penny would get us uh, to 4%. But my, my, my other question is, have you looked at, obviously you are not the superintendent of schools, but have you looked at how, um, at how if we fund the school transfer uh, 160 million, I think, was about the amount, uh, no, what was uh, it? It was a quarter of a billion, it's 254 million. Sorry, but I was saying in your budget. Oh, in my budget, okay. 165 in your budget, right. what that is uh, on an average uh, teacher pay increase versus what our average employee increase uh, would be. Have you compared the two? Or is the question what the 165 million would allow the schools to do in terms mm -hmm. of a teacher pay increase? Yes, so they've asked for a 6% increase. Um, we obviously, we, you know, 165 doesn't give them a 6% increase. We've proposed a 2% increase for our employees. So would 165 be a 2% increase for teachers? Would it be a 4 You know, that's yeah. why I'm trying. Have we equalized those yeah. two? Yeah, back in the envelope would be about another 3% increase for uh, schools employees in July. What they've been, they did that 2% increase in January. And um, I think that when they've been looking at averages, they've been kind of splitting that and counting 1% towards last year and 1% towards this year. So if they were able to do 3% as part of July and including half of that 2%, that would be about a 4% average yeah. for um, the school's employees. And right now for our general county employees, we're just below 4% average in terms of what's in this budget. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like us to consider trying to um, come close uh, in what we're providing to our own employees and also what we're providing uh, to teachers. That's just a, a concern of mine. Uh, and obviously, we've got two and a half months to talk about that. So I'm not saying that it has to be or anything like that. I'm just pointing that out. Sorry. Yeah, Supervisor Beerman, I, I would suggest, that especially with uh, two new board members, if we could circulate an updated, we ask for this, if not every year, close to every year, um, an updated uh, timeline over the past 10 years or so that shows you uh, school employee pay increases and county employee pay increases because what has happened over the years is that they're not ever necessarily equal, uh, but over a 10-year horizon, uh, they even out. And I think it's helpful for us to kind of see what that, what that has looked like in the past and then under this proposed budget, what that would look like uh, this year, as well as the question that, that Supervisor Bierman asked, recognizing it's a projection, because obviously no matter what we transfer to the schools, whatever that amount is, it's going to be up to them to determine. But because there was a mid-year adjustment made on the school side, I think it's important for us to see that updated chart just so that we can better better answer that question as part of a budget Q&A. Sorry for my ig ignorance on that, but we'll, we'll look at in, into that chart. Um, I don't necessarily want to beat a dead horse, but I will. Uh, when it comes to school funding, um, uh, I saw in some of the uh, the stuff that was released about the House budget on 
Um, on uh, Sunday, there were claims that uh, in certain school districts that were higher risk would get $900 more per pupil. Uh, that was touted as something that was really great. Obviously, that's probably not what we will get per pupil, and that is still a heck of a lot less than $1,900 per pupil. Uh, I would like to note um, that we talk about this a lot for our own benefit, obviously, but $1,900 per pupil would go a long way in lots of counties. It would go a long way in Wise County, Virginia. It would go a long way in Norfolk. It would go a long way in Richmond. It would go a long way. I could do the whole state, but I won't. Um, I'll save you that. So I will just end by... Um, uh, by saying that and then I'm hopeful that we will uh, see more out of out of Richmond uh, and to thank you all for your efforts uh, here today and uh, looking forward to two months of process here so thank you thank you sir thank you very much uh, supervisor Beerman and uh, everyone's had a chance uh, let's see if, yeah supervisor Lusk oh. Town hall. I realized I forgot to announce my budget town hall. Yeah, I think that's what Supervisor Lusk I'm was going to be doing today. Oh, okay. I'm channeling. Well, go, go ahead, <laughs> Supervisor Lusk. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Franconia District will host its uh, virtual town hall meeting on March 14, 2024, from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, it will be um, on Channel 16 and Facebook Live. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lusk. Supervisor Beerman. Uh, we will hold our first budget town hall at the McLean Community Center on uh, March 11th in person. It won't be on, on Channel 16. That will be the Braddock Town Hall on March 11th. Uh, but we will be on Facebook Live, and we're planning a second budget town hall uh, in Herndon the week of uh, March 18th. Excellent. Thank you. And I know that our budget office, uh, working with OPA, will help publicize uh, all of these countywide. And, and I would also um, ask our staff uh, to provide us uh, the right way for us to message the new text feature, the sure. language access feature. Mm -hmm. These are brand new this year. And I think all of us want to make sure that our communities uh, know of those new opportunities and how to access them. So if you could kind of give us a snippet that we can all put consistently uh, in our newsletters and messages out to the community. Because again, as I said earlier, uh, every budget cycle that we go through is dramatically improved uh, due to public input. And the more of that we can get, uh, the better this process works. And so we'll want to advertise that widely. Okay. Uh, any closing comments, Mr. Hill? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this was number seven for me. It feels like it's like number two. Um, but the strategic plan annual report is also out. Uh, we will be forwarding that to each and every board office. Uh, it's a great read, in my opinion, because of the connectivity with our dashboards and our mobility transportation has been publicized by many news outlets. As we work through the process, you will see how we are trying to tie the dots in to help you make data informed decisions as well as having our community understand what's happening in Fairfax County. Again, I just want to say thank you for the trust and the confidence and to the team. Thank you so much for all the hard work, especially yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all uh, very much. Appreciate the presentation. And